Okay, we're going to get started. It looks like we have a healthy turnout and I just want to thank everyone for coming and joining us today. I am Karen Trivett. I'm an associate professor and head of special collections and college archives here at the Fashion Institute of Technology's Gladys Marcus Library. And we are thrilled to have this open house via Instagram Live. It's our first attempt at this, so I will ask you ahead of time to forgive any bumps in the road. Um, and I want to thank all of the staff from uh, Special Collections. Uh, that includes April Callahan, Samantha Levin, James Ferguson, and our newest staff member, thanks to a grant that we received, Danielle Patterson, who's helping immensely on this endeavor. So welcome again to our open house. I want to just give you some introductory remarks and then I'm going to pass it off to our various curatorial staff to go more in depth in terms of what our holdings are and we'll show you some real examples of what those are over the next 40 to 50 minutes because we want to leave some time at the end of the hour for some questions. So with that, let me give you what I think is our overarching charter uh, statement, which is our mission statement. And it reads, whether operating on campus or remotely, the mission of Special Collections and College Archives, also known as SPARC, it remains the same. That mission is to foster research across and beyond the FIT community by acquiring, preserving, and providing universal access to primary research materials, including college archival records. Unit materials include physical, digital, and three-dimensional examples. All acquisitions support one or more curricula offered here at FIT. Our user community is as diverse as the content on our shelves, and all are welcome. And I want to drive that point home especially because we are a publicly funded institution. The Fashion Institute of Technology is part of the State University of New York, and we are open by appointment, but open to all. Um, we are probably one of the least restrictive units of our type. Um, I like to say that we successfully balance preserving the content for long-term access by generations of researchers while inviting those generations in to partake of our holdings. Speaking of our holdings, we have over 6,000 linear feet of shelves that hold manuscript collections, rare books and rare periodicals, or magazines to some of you, and the college archives. Beyond the 6,000 linear feet of shelves, we have about eight terabytes of digital assets, and that part of our collection grows practically every single day. We're going to introduce you to some of those assets a little later in our program. But while you visit that part of the program, I want you to remember that it is not stagnant. It does grow and every single day, there's more content added to that collection. Our other collection, our physical collections, also grow fairly rapidly. Um, we're approached regularly by donors that have relevant content that they want to see made accessible to researchers whether it's the novice researcher in an undergrad program here or somewhere else, or the scholar that is writing a peer-reviewed journal article or even a monograph. Going back to our collections, our manuscript collections are just that. They are non-published, unique assets, and in our manuscript collections, of which there are about 400 and almost 70 now discrete collections, we have over half a million works of art on paper, mostly fashion sketches, textile sketches, costume designs, and the like. Our oldest piece in the manuscript holdings dates from 1590, and it's an Italian gentleman in the garb of the day. Our oldest monograph 
dates to 1680, and it is a volume on Jewish liturgical vestments. And you might think that because they're old, they're fragile, do not misunderstand the fact that it's probably the strongest uh, paper we have in the collection. Mm -hmm. Also, in terms of rare periodicals, those date back to, I would say, 1790, and they uh, total about 700 unique titles across the, uh, across the periodicals holdings. So, as you can see or hear, we have a lot to talk to you about today, a lot to show you. And I want to limit my comments so that we can let the curatorial staff give you that deeper dive. We're gonna start with uh, the curator of manuscript collections, April Callahan. She has her master's degree here, from here at FIT in fashion and textile studies, and she is a renowned fashion historian. She augments the information science side of our operation beautifully. And with that, I will invite April to join us. Just one moment for the segue. Hello, everyone. <laughs> It's, it's nice to see the inside of the office. Yes. <laughs> so I think what we're going to do today, um, um, by the way, as Karen already introduced me, I'm April Callahan. Um, I am the curator of manuscript collections at FIT Special Collections. And I thought what we would do today is just kind of, you know, we do these tours quite a lot for classes and students. Um, and we're going to kind of you know, reinvent the wheel and then try to do this for the first time on Instagram Live. So basically it's a show and tell today. Um, and so um, these are some of my favorite objects in the collections that, that we're gonna talk about today. And I'm just gonna tell you a little bit about them and then I'm gonna pass it on um, to Samantha and Sam's gonna talk about um, her role as the curator of digital assets. So, um, one of the very, one of my all time favorite things, and I think this is a huge staff favorite in general, um, is Gallery des Modes Costume Francaise. And Karen mentioned that some of our periodicals, you know, date back to the 18th century. And this is a supreme example of that. Um, this series, and it's, it's a series of fashion plates or prints, um, has been called the most important and the most beautiful example a record of 18th century fashion known to exist. So what makes this um, publication so incredibly special is the fact that it dates between 1778 to 1787 and that is when Marie Antoinette was was Queen of France. Um, but the images that we see here um, are actually taken from real life. So you know obviously fashion existed before photography um, came into existence. So how did people learn about what the newest trends, what the newest fashions were? You know, how was the new and the news of fashion spread? And it was through prints, just like this. Um, and so these were available by subscription. Um, you could get them colored or uncolored, depending on how much you wanted to pay. But again, as I mentioned, these were taken from real life. So there were artists that were hanging out at the Court of Versailles or hanging out, you know, at the like most fashionable hot spots in Paris. And they were sketching what women were wearing. Um, and then they would, you know, take those back. Then they would, the, the whole thing would be engraved. Then it had to be hand tinted because um, color printing did not yet exist. So these were all hand colored. Um, and then you could go and pick up your set at the, at the printmaker or you could get it sent um, to you in the mail. Um, and and I'm, I'm, I want to point out that mail aspect because these were extremely expensive. Um, and basically, you know, it would only be like 
the very wealthy or even aristocrats uh, or, or parts of a monarchy in other countries that would be able to afford something like this and follow the pace of French fashion, you know, at this level. So this is incredibly special and, and one of my all time favorite things. I, I actually, I personally own a few plates that I have managed to find um, through purveyors in France that are in my house. And that's how much I love this publication. So should we move on to the next item? Ah, uh, yes. Okay. So this is really fun. And, you know, we were just, I would, I just mentioned um, that obviously photography didn't exist quite yet in the 18th century. You know, we see it kind of really rise and become available to the masses in the middle of the um, 19th century. But uh, this publication here is incredibly special. It is again French. It's called Le Mode Pratique. And what makes it so incredibly special is this image on the next page. And this is a very early example of fashion photography. Um, La Mode Pratique, if it's not the very first magazine to incorporate fashion photography, um, it's one of the very first. I, uh, it's pretty much agreed on by fashion historians that they were the first, but I never, I never want to commit fully to that because when you do that, then you know, something else comes up and proves you wrong. So, um, but it's incredibly beautiful. And, um, you know, the, the, the photographs themselves kind of resemble the illustrations. Um, and and it's just like that really kind of like nascent, very kind of like beginning in the 1890s of fashion photography. Now, photography as portraiture had certainly existed before that um, in the, in, for decades. Um, but we're talking about when fashion publishers started incorporating photography into the magazine. Um, of course, it was super, super expensive to do this. So again, yet another luxury publication, um, somewhat similar to Gallery, um, but in a, in, a, in a whole different way. But again, probably quite quite pricey at the time. So we are quite fortunate to have this um, in our collection. Perhaps we'll move on to the next item. Oh, yes. Um, so as Karen mentioned, you know, we have uh, more than 470 manuscript collections and meeting unpublished works. Um, a lot of those half of a million original works of art on paper are actually original fashion sketches. And these are by um, Muriel King, who was one of the very first American fashion designers to become somewhat of a household name in the 1930s. Um, and she began her career actually as an artist um, and then moved to Paris and started working as a fashion illustrator. Um, and she basically was like living in Paris, hanging out, doing her thing, sending her drawings back so that like American Vogue or American Harper's Bazaar could publish them and follow what was going on in France at the time. Um, but there were all, also a lot of very wealthy American women who were either expats or perhaps they were just going to Paris a couple times a year to buy their couture road robes. And she became friendly with all these very wealthy American women. And they were like, Muriel, where are you getting all your clothes? Because we're going to all the couture places and we're not seeing what it is that you're wearing and it's amazing. So they convince her to come back um, to the United States, um, specifically New York um, in 1932, 1931, 1932, and open up a custom salon, AKA a couture house. So um, they bankrolled her and these are some of her really, really, really amazing sketches. And um, I, I think I probably need to like speed up a little bit here because we have a couple other objects to talk about. But um, I just want to I just want to say something really spectacular about Muriel is the fact that she didn't know how to sew, and uh, you would be surprised to to learn that there are quite a lot of very very famous fashion designers who don't cut, they don't know pattern making, they don't drape, um, and so how Muriel um, created her designs was by way of these really amazing illustrations that you see here. You probably have noted how they're from multiple views. And that's because she, that's how she communicated with the rest of her staff, who were the ones that were um, responsible for the pattern making and the draping and, um, and all of the actual technical construction aspects of her designs. So 
Um, next we have, oh yes, these are great. So um, some more original sketches. Um, Everyone, we all know Bergdorf Goodman, right? The, the, the much beloved and famed American New York City department store. Um, one of the very cool things about Bergdorf in the late 19th and even through up until like the like 70s, um, 19, uh, 1970s, is the fact that they had these relation, they had a relationship with a lot of the top couturiers like Christian Dior or Hubert de Givenchy, where they would execute licensing agreements. And basically, they would be able to offer through these licensing agreements, and we're looking at Dior sketches here, um, that American women could come into Bergdorf Goodman to the custom salon by appointment only and have a private um, you know, appointment and select their clothing and it would be made at Bergdorf Goodman for them. But essentially it was the Dior designs. Um, and it was, it was quite cool. We have many examples of um, this kind of working relationship in the museum at FIT where the Bergdorf Goodman label would be right next to the Dior label. So it was, it was all on the up and up. It was all legit, but you were getting your Dior made for you at Bergdorf's so you didn't have to travel to Paris. So, um, and this collection is probably one of our most used and most popular collections. Um, it just, it, it is this an amazing like record of, of um, you know, couture that was being offered in America at this time, you know, really from like, there's some hat sketches from the 20s, but for the most part, this collection really dates um, to the 1940s, 1950s, 1960s. Um, and the, the custom salon closed in 1971 or 1970, if, if, I'm, if I'm not correct. But, um, you know, also we're looking at Dior, but there's also Balenciaga and everybody else that you can think of in this collection, which, which is very fun. Okay, and our last item, um, and I just want to, and I, and I selected this item because, again, it is one of my favorites, and I just want to underscore the point that not everything that we have in the collection is quite old. Um, this is an edition of Visionaire, which is considered to be a publication, right, a periodical, um, but it's not necessarily always a book or a magazine. Um, it is issued at several times during the year and every incarnation of Visionaire is completely different. So here we have some little packets, right? It says exotic, it has a name of um, perhaps an artist and also somebody who is a, um, works for a flavor company, right? So people create artificial flavors just like they do perfumes. Um, and then this is Mommy. Um, the image was created by Yoko Ono, who paired with Kevin Miller to create a flavor. And that is actually what is inside these little packets. So if anybody is a fan of mint and you have been to the bodega in the last few years and got those little ones that are like the little gel things that dissolve on your on your tongue that's what's in here and the the flavor artists have worked with a contemporary artist or a photographer or someone else who creates the images that are in the book so it's a it's very cool pairing um they've also done another edition similar to this um which which um, uses scent um instead of taste, but every single edition of Visionaire um, has a theme and uh, it explores that kind of like this, this interesting collaboration between art, fashion, etc. Um, and I think now we have, I mean, Visionaire is very expensive. It's limited edition only. It's highly collectible. Um, and I think we have about not quite half of every single edition at this point now. So um, again, um, people come to come to visit this title quite frequently and and it could be you know this is a book and a, and a, a flavor pairing but it could be something as simple as a record um, or a different edition of Visionaire might be toys um, so they're really kind of like periodically published objects um, less so than like a book or a magazine and I think I think that's all I have to say for now <laughs> thank you April that was wonderful. Thank you so much. Awesome. So now we're going to segue to talk about our digital assets. And with that, I'd like to invite Samantha Levin 
to come in and give us uh, an overview of that part of our operation. It'll be just a second. So I'm not actually sure. Oh, I see. Thank you for your patience, everyone. We're just waiting for Samantha to join us. April, I think you might have to click off in order to join. I'm not 100% sure, but I think you might have okay. to. Okay, I don't have any options for that. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna just log out and then I'll come back. Awesome, thank, thank you. you. Mm -hmm. Well, while we're waiting for Samantha to join us, I'd like to ask Danielle to escort me to the computer. Yes. And we will look at some of these digital assets because these are available to you any time of day, as long as you have an internet connection. Um, here you see our Spark Digital Instance. And again, Spark, S-P-A-R-C, is short for Special Collections and College Archives. And it's great to have eight terabytes of digital assets, but then how do we get these to you, the researcher? And we do that by this vehicle, Spark Digital. And I'm gonna ask Danielle if she'll sort of zoom in on the URL address. And I hope you can see that. It's Spark Digital dot f-i-t-n-y-c dot e-d-u so you're welcome to hop on and check it out um, in the meantime i'd like to ask danielle if she'll point us to images because that's what this resource is all about and as of today we have just under eight thousand images uh, from our full library of uh, eight terabytes here available to you via spark digital and as you can see, it comes up uh, focusing on one particular collection, but you can also search in an aggregated way by collections. And I'll ask Danielle to go there. And here you see a total of 28 discrete collections. Some of this material is from our manuscript collections, most of it in fact, and some of it is also from rare books and periodicals. It just depends. We don't have a wealth of resources to digitize um, by our own uh, whim. So what we do is we digitize when someone, an outside researcher, asks for content that, to, that should be digitized for their end purpose, whether it's a publication, uh, a presentation, what have you. So um, what you're seeing is the vast array of content available to you simply with, hi, Samantha. Hey. Welcome. Welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Yes. Please, I... please take the wheel. Okay. <laughs> Sorry about that, everyone. I have no idea what happened. It wouldn't let me in. Now I'm here. Um, so um, I hope I don't repeat what Karen just said about Spark Digital, but um, Yes, this is a wonderful asset that we have for you to see um, some of the physical objects that we have in our collection that have been digitized. Um, we have thousands of images um, from specific collections in there that you can um, browse through using the menus at the top of the screen. Um, you can just look through that images tab and, and scroll through, but you can also um, sort on the top right there's a way to sort it automatically sorts by whatever we've uploaded most recently so you can go in there and do it by creator or by um, published date you can see our oldest digitized um, asset in there and what's really cool is that you can search by color um, if well 
Danielle just clicked into one of the things. Sorry, sorry, Danielle. If you look at the top, there are all those color swatches. You can click on one of those um, little dots and it brings up everything purple um, or everything yellow, which is a really neat way of, of searching through. Sometimes if you click the yellow, it'll bring up everything with a CPO background. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's not perfect, but it is still really a wonderful tool that gets used a lot. Um, we also have collections. Um, so if you wanted to, um, if you, yeah, uh, click on the collections, you can um, bring up images that were digitized from specific manuscript collections or specific um, monographs, et cetera. And that helps sort things and group things for you, especially if you're looking for something specific. Um, and again, you can sort that, um, those collections in different ways. Um, and then if we look at the exhibitions, that's also a really wonderful um, way to dive into our collections. The, ex the exhibitions um, have a lot of content that describe what we have. Our most recent one is the Beller collection that we're pointing to now um, that uh, quite a few of our graduate students at FIT worked on and, and they just did some wonderful work. It pairs um, the Max Meyer and A. Beller and Company sketch collection with some actual garments. And there's a lot of text in there that we won't be able to see here, but um, it was pieced together online by our colleague in the library, Joseph Anderson. Um, and it's a really wonderful dive into what Spark holds. Um, at least in that one collection and, and how it, how it pairs with actual garments. Um, so it's really neat. Um, highly recommend you look through those exhibitions in there. Um, and lastly, with um, Spark Digital, you can, of course, come in here and do keyword searches. Um, just by entering, here's the front page, but there's also a, a search um, bar on the top right hand side of the screen. Um, any term that you're interested in, you can type that on in there and it'll come up. Um, and then you can sort in various different other ways. Um, so yeah, here's a search for Dior. So you can filter the results, like it brings up all sorts of stuff, but you can filter your results by um, what may have come up in the search results to help you um, dig deeper or be more specific. And here we are looking at one of the um, items themselves, and of course it connects to other items. And the last really cool um, feature about Spark Digital that I want to show you all is that you can zoom in. When we, when we digitize these things, we digitize at a very high level. Yes, anyone can access this. It's um, publicly available. So um, we digitize at a very high level. Um, DPI and that allows you to really, really zoom in a lot and see the details like the way an artist um, uh, express themselves with pen and ink. Um, we try to get the colors as precise as possible. Of course, that doesn't translate digitally um, too accurately, but we try to be as close as we can. You can see all the fuzz in her hat there. It's really, really wonderful. Um, so yeah, um, this is a really wonderful tool. We have, we have tens of thousands of digitized images to add to this, um, and we hope to be able to do that in the next few months. Um, digitization is a bit of a slow process, but we're getting there. Um, so yeah, that's, that's um, Spark Digital in a nutshell. Um, if we could move on to the web archive love to share that with you. Okay, so as synchronous as it could be, we started this web archive at the end of 2019. And um, we use something called Archivit, which is software created by the Internet Archive. Um, the Internet Archive is fantastic. And for those who, who may not be aware, they have been archiving the web since, I think, 1997. Um, they foresaw a need um, to archive web pages, which come and go really, really quickly, um, to archive for our historical record, international historical record over time. Um, 
archiving the web is really hard because digital tools grow and change and develop constantly. And so to keep up with new developments, um, when Flash arrived on the scene and then just as quickly disappeared from the scene, um, how do you start archiving it and how do you keep um, showing that kind of software over time? So the problem with the internet archives um, capabilities is that there are billions and billions and billions of web pages so they don't crawl everything so um, there's just too much to capture so they um, offered archivit um, as a subscription tool for institutions archival institutions like spark to start archiving um, whatever their collection development scope might be so our collection development scope is the FIT website and some affiliated sites. Um, so if you look here, this is the public um, access view of our web archive and, and what I've been able to capture thus far. So it's mainly our um, fitnyc.edu domain, but it also goes into our union website, um, the museum, as you see here, um, the museum at FIT exhibition web pages under sites is an old domain that um, will be put to rest at some point in the next six months ish or so. Our entire website is about to be revamped. And so I am frantically going through trying to preserve what we've got now. Um, and then the 70th anniversary timeline from back in 2014, as well as our new iteration of that um, for the 75th anniversary. Here's our union, their 75th anniversary, and all of our blogs, um, the fashion history timeline, so various FIT projects that could come out of different departments. I try to capture um, the um, pretty much anything you can think of, I try to capture before it changes over time. Um, and as you can imagine, 2020, our website has been changing like crazy because we've just been dealing with so much um, change, um, trying to adjust to our new lives and what we've been going through. So to capture what gets published online is so important. Um, and keeping up with it is is has been quite a challenge. Um, so the last thing I'd love to suggest is that if um, you know we don't go into social networking um, sites for two reasons. One, they're very hard to keep up with because they change so often, but more so it's because they are um, dynamic web content. So there are comments and there are posts and images and videos and all sorts of stuff. Um, and places like places, um, platforms like Facebook and Instagram often change their programming. So it's hard to keep up with what those changes are. Um, Instagram sometime in May or June um, made themselves more private and hard to access. So we can't really crawl Instagram sites anymore, although that's improved a little bit. Um, so we've missed a whole bunch of content. We also don't capture the websites of professors and students outside of our domain. So I want to recommend to any of you um, inside or outside FIT um, to archive your own web pages and you can use the Internet Archive if you just go to um, um, web.archive.org you'll see something on the bottom right that says save page now throw your favorite url in there and archive that url into the internet archive and you will be able to access that content um, for as long as the internet archive is up and running um, and that's all i've got that's plenty samantha thank you so much <laughs> sure <laughs> wonderful did we mention the Wayback Machine? Um, I can bring that up as well. The Wayback Machine is actually a playback um, tool. So it's not what archives, um, the tool that archives stuff, there are a few of them, but the two of them that the Internet Archive uses is called Brosler and Heratrix. And you won't see those terms on, <laughs> on the Internet Archive. You just plop something in there and it'll crawl it. 
when you play it back, um, the interface that Danielle was just showing everyone is our, the Archivit interface. And the Archivit interface uses their Wayback software, um, so many onion layers, um, to play back any web page that's been crawled on a time basis. So you can go back to a certain moment in time um, and you can go back to 1997, I want to say it goes all the way back um, to the beginning of Web Archives for the FIT website. Yeah. Um, but we don't have control of those files, those archival files. Um, and there are holes in there. So there's no one checking to make sure it gets everything. So there are um, times that you'll go to and you'll see lots of broken images and missing sites and whatever so the the hope of this web archiving program is to um i can't go back in time obviously because that's not published anymore but to keep that from happening from 2020 and on and to keep crawling and making sure that the archivist software grabs everything and that you can go and play it back um either online or um in person at spark when we reopen yeah. So thank you very much. That was so helpful and informative. I uh, really appreciate it, Samantha. My pleasure. And with that, I'm going to invite James Ferguson to join us. Thanks, Samantha. Bye. Bye. Okay. Just hold on, folks, while we bring James in. Just sent the request. All right. <laughs> so as you can see, I'm here in the space. And now I'm welcoming James to the Hi. space of Instagram. Hi, James. Hi, Karen. Good How to are you? Good to see you. Doing all right. Enjoying this. Very Hi. good. Oh, I'm James Ferguson. I'm a catalog unit and curator for our college archives chain. Uh, the mission of the archives is to re retain and maintain the 77 year history and ever ongoing of FIT through primary course materials and college records dating from its founding back in 1945 to the present day and beginning. College archives are comprised of over 200 uh, linear feed materials that document the people, events, buildings, and the research that they continue to make the college the acclaimed is today. Uh, history of FIT is also, it's a vital part of the history of New York's garment district and the fashion industry itself. Um, it's not just eyes and ears to the fashion world. It's an active body in it. Uh, many resources contained within our archives include uh, college records that are deemed to have enduring historical value. These originate from the Board of Trustees, from the President's Office, Academic Affairs, Communications and External Relations, and beyond, whatever departments, you know, feed into uh, we have meeting minutes from the Board of Trustees in major decisions throughout the history of the college. Uh, we have a collection of college course catalogs and college yearbooks, the portfolio yearbooks, and commencement programs dating back to the 1940s, uh, which are just lovely little, you know, timepieces in and of themselves you're speaking you're speaking my language james because you just mentioned probably the three most complete collections we have in the college archive and completion is basically you know the drug of choice to archivists <laughs> so we have the full run of college catalogs yearbooks and um i forgot the third one that you just mentioned oh the uh, commencement programs programs, which are also fascinating to Absolutely. go through. The was when I joined the unit, was cataloging those commencement programs. Absolutely. Well, I'm 
steer your conversation, which is fascinating, to our oral history collection, which is part of the College Archives. What can you tell viewers about that? Uh, well, the oral history is this extensive collection of interviews that we've made dating back through, I think there's even like Umatic, going back in the days of three quarter inch video tape cassettes. 1977, I think is our first capture. You go. Um, it's uh, essentially interviews with movers and shakers throughout the fashion world. Mm -hmm. uh, important to the college itself, but also, also to the larger fashion world, the sort of designers and models and journalists. Um, so we have a lot of these collections and we're currently working on this massive undertaking to make all of those gems digitally available and discoverable. Yes. It's a gradual process, but a piece at a time, more and more and more is being added and we're working to make it readily discoverable so you can all access, you know, the wealth of information and insight that all these people have to contribute. Right. And we're talking about decision makers from the retail sector, from manufacturing, um, as you said, from modeling, the modeling industry, which is adjacent, of course, to fashion and beauty. Um, we have a beautiful series of interviews from Ford, the Ford Modeling Agency. Uh, we teamed up with them in 2010, 2011, and captured roughly 70 interviews. So, and it was from mostly their, what they called their heritage unit. So models that were working as far back as the early 60s, late 50s, early 60s. So it gives you a nice sort of longitudinal overview of what the modeling uh, industry was like over time which is really fascinating. It takes a while to get through all the content, but you can really come away with uh, some very interesting, um, you know, overviews of the industry. Can I access the commencement program from 1973? I would encourage you, uh, Bernadette, to email us. Um, and our email address is on our Instagram page, but I'll say it here as well, which is FI. C L I B S P A R C at F I T N Y C dot E D U, and we will get that program to you. James, what else can we tell uh, people? In addition to all of that, we've got a trove of historical photographs yes. that acquired from uh, many of them from communications and external relations, but from other units throughout the college. Uh, that collection featured heavily in uh, physical and digital materials related to our recent 75th anniversary celebrations that yeah. Samantha was just mentioning. Uh, you can find, we have a, online a timeline. There's a 75th anniversary timeline that you can look at for FIT. Uh, but we've also created a sort of physical materials that we had throughout the college. And a lot of these uh, wonderful photographs from student fashion shows, you know, from the 40s, 50s. Oh, wonderful. Of the campus we have, the whole move to 27th Street and building, you know, what we now know as the college. Yes. Um, we also have uh, records from the museum at FIT mm -hmm. and at the that includes exhibition literature, all kinds of programs and brochures, administrative records and correspondence. Yes. We have a collection of realia, the memorabilia, right. three-dimensional objects from an array of FIT events and initiatives over the years. Including groundbreakings. Yes, uh, <laughs> we, if you need, Deep inside yourself, you realize that you really need to see the groundbreaking shovel from the... <laughs> <laughs> Which one of five, James? Uh, yeah, we've got it. You can come to play. And uh, yes, uh, April's mentioning the Soul Club fashion shows. Those yep. are spectacular. We have video and audio recordings from decades of our fashion shows. And... Uh, 
a couple of years back, I guess, that created a display in our exhibition cases right outside the park mm -hmm. and had a video running from the Soul Factory show. And that was constantly stopping people in their track. Absolutely. The FIT history and fashion unfolding in front of them. That was really great. Um, I'd like you to tell people, if you will, you've been working for quite a while on a special project relative to marketing files, which was an effort born out of the library itself. Yeah. Uh, the marketing files uh, were a resource that had hand collected and compiled over 30,000 articles and company materials dating from 1949 to 1995 when the files were discontinued. Actually, my first uh, job at FIT was working in this uh, unit that used to exist, the vertical files that collected assorted designer files, costume files, fashion files. And this was a part of that. So long ago, 26 years ago, when I started here, uh, I was adding materials to this file. And I just finished last week weeding and capturing all of the library's old marketing files collections. Um, they All these articles and company materials, programs, brochures, things like that, uh, um, related to marketing and the business end of the fashion industry. Right. Uh, went through weeding out redundancies that we can access online. Uh, so the 10,000 so articles and materials that remain are all those that cannot readily be sourced online. So right. you on in and find an array of uh, informational materials that would be difficult to capture otherwise. What would you say are some of the typical categories that a researcher can find in the marketing files? There is a large number uh, going through individual retail stores. Uh, one of the last, last deep dives I was doing was going through all kinds of articles relating to Woolworths and Walmart and Sears, as well as more Hyatt, certainly uh, Bergdorf Goodman and Marshall Field um, and Gucci, you know, going through those, it goes through uh, assorted uh, design houses, as well as retail stores, the, appar the various forms of the apparel industry, uh, cosmetic and toiletry industries articles relating to, you know, Elizabeth Arden and L'Oreal, um, that's a part of it. Um, furs uh, were its own thing. Uh, we've got uh, some files of black fashion uh, from 1968 to 1992. Yeah. It's a, a pretty extensive array going yeah. through. Yeah. And I'm so thrilled that you have completed that project and now we can promote it like crazy. Yeah. <laughs> Which we're kind of doing right now. <laughs> so James, any, any final words before we toss it out for some Q and A? Oh my gosh. I'm trying to think if there's anything else, anyone else. I, honestly, I, I'd recommend for all of our domains to just come take, to dive in and see what you find. I mean, to me, there's certain treasures that are especially meaningful to me. Or, uh, if we have our collection of FIT's own AIDS memorial quilts mm -hmm. created by members of the FIT community memory of lives that the college lost to that other plague. Yeah. Still going. Um, that was incredible to see. We have uh, all kinds of wonderful coverage of uh, fashion illustrator Antonio Lopez. Uh, dating back to 1962 when he was a student here at FIT and right. um, and just like fun things in our realia. There's an old button protesting the Vietnam War. Uh, there never was a good war, a bad peace with the well, FIT. That's one of my favorite pieces in the whole unit. Yeah. <laughs> I, I would encourage people to just check it out. Yeah. We even have a question sort of reflective of that statement, James. Uh, is the collection open to visitors? Absolutely. Right now, we are in a holding or pause pattern because of the pandemic. 
but I'm so glad you brought this up, uh, Leslie, because on the typical day, we are open seven days a week, or week, I should say. We're open seven days a week, and we have a slot of three hours every day for researchers to come in. You do not have to be affiliated with FIT. I said in the very beginning of our program today that we are a public institution, and I love that we balance preserving the content with making it as widely accessible as we possibly can. So Leslie, you would be more than welcome to come visit. Um, I would encourage you to visit our webpage um, to get a sense of our operations uh, because it's very fluid right now because of COVID. Um, we're very hopeful that maybe in the fall, operations can look more like what we used to call normal, um, but it's, it's still very fluid and decisions firm have not been made just yet. So I want to open it up. I want to first thank all of the curators, all of the associates, all of the staff of SPARC because it could not operate without them. And I always open, usually I always open uh, open houses with the statement that our most important resources are our human resources. And so I very much want to thank those people who contribute so much to the success of the unit. So any questions from any of you out there while we still have some time left? I always say I will not hold you hostage. <laughs> and we can certainly toggle back to an earlier contributor to the today's program if you have a specific question for a specific person. We can't wait to have you come visit, Melanie. Can you tell us what your research interest might be? And while Melanie's thinking about that, I'll answer Leslie's question. What do you feel is missing in the collection? That's a very good question. When I first started here, our strength, which is still our strength, was American fashion for women and 20th century. But we've really pushed the bookends out. Um, we've, as I've mentioned earlier, we reach much further back than the 20th century and we reach beyond the United States. Um, so to make, yes, April's mentioning. Um, what I tried to do in the very beginning is I, when I noticed the strength is I wanted to bolster or buttress where we were weak, which was menswear. And since we teach menswear here at FIT, it makes everything, you know, uh, it, it makes me want to fulfill the mission, which I mentioned earlier, to foster the original research. Um, for anyone who attends FIT and is interested in those subject areas. How does the Francis Needy collection fit into SPARC? Ah, oh, well, Paul, it is incredibly important. It is a discrete manuscript collection of original fashion illustrations dating back to the teens, the 19 teens, that is, uh, right up through the late 20, uh, 20, uh, 10s. So, um, Francis Needy was a fashion illustration professor, not only here at FIT, but at other institutions around the city. And she was so revered by her um, followers, her students, that she was, once she passed away, she was um, remembered uh, in a loving way by some of her closest uh, followers by the establishment of the Francis Needy collection of original fashion illustration. And what it exudes is her philosophy, her pedagogical approach to teaching fashion illustration, the really stringent, not call for perfection, but certainly a call for striving towards perfection in fashion illustration. 
um, Antonio Lopez's work is included in the Francis Newby collection, as is Alvin Pinsler's, um, Jay Crawford, um, Dorothy Hood. Um, I could go on. Uh, all of this information is available through our website. So if you have any specific questions about that particular collection, you're more than welcome to email us. Again, our email address is fitlibsparc at fitnyc.edu. And we have another question. When will the museum reopen? A million dollar question. Uh, so thank you for asking it. Um, I wish I could tell you the museum is, as you know, part of the Fashion Institute of Technology, as is the Gladys Marcus Library. We are not the same unit. We are sibling units here on campus. And so their operations are specific to them uh, as opposed to us. And so uh, we might not know for some time uh, those decisions that are being made um, as to their reopening. But um, all I can tell you is check the website. Again, I know it's frustrating. These are frustrating times. Uh, but I know they are at the ready to uh, please you, to, to instruct you, to entertain you with a beautiful upcoming exhibition. And if you're following the thread here, April has just offered some information. Thank you, April. Any other questions? We have about five minutes. We can fill them with your inquiry. Are there any parting words from staff? that you'd like to contribute. I'll take that as a no, unless I hear from you in the next few seconds. I'll give everyone just another opportunity to pose a question uh, in the thread before we sign off. Again, I want to thank everyone for attending today. We had a very healthy uh, response. Um, we do have another question come in right now from Leslie. Are the students able to attend courses in person? That is also a moving target. Uh, not to um, sidestep the question. I'm answering it as honestly as I can. Um, there are some classes that truly necessitate, even mandate, uh, in-person instruction. Those are very few and far between. Um, most of them are uh, centered in the graduate programs that we offer here at FIT. So it's really um, the priority is to keep the community safe and that will rule the day until um, the environment dictates another way to make a decision. Paul, I want to thank you for joining us. And with that, I will just say once again, thank you for joining us today, this inaugural Instagram Live effort on the uh, part of the FIT Gladys Marcus Library Special Collections and College Archives. Uh, I'm Karen Trivett. It's been a very much pleasure for me to spend this last hour with you all and do not hesitate to reach out and let us know what you're curious about. We'd be happy to answer that curiosity. Thank you so much. Have a great day.